Connors T, how are ye? Welcome to the Candle of Tales podcast. We are breathing life back into Irish myths with traditional Irish storytelling accompanied by music. My name is Aaron Hegarty and this week we have the story of the Kingship of Mangan. This is a part two of a two-part episode told by my sister, Sarah Hegarty, the other co-founder of Candle of Tales. Now stay tuned till the end of the podcast to hear our latest news and hear a sneak peek of next week's story. As always, we will be going live on YouTube on Sunday, 7pm Irish time to chat about this myth. So join in the conversation if you'd like. We wouldn't be able to continue to make these podcasts without the support of our patrons. Patrons, I guess, which we are very, very grateful for. So thank you. If you'd like to contribute, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or share, subscribe, like, or you can even leave a review if you like what we do. It makes all the difference. Now, Sit back and listen to this week's story. Hey, Sorica, tell us the story, will you? Mongan was raised in Tirchangara, the land of promise, by Mananon MacLear, who taught him magic and the wisdom of the other world. But he knew that one day he would return to Ulster. His father, Fiacre Finn, shared the kingship with Fiacre Dove, and he, Mangan, was betrothed to marry the daughter of Fiacre Dove. He knew as well that there was the son of a servant, Macan Dove, who had been born on the same day as both Mangan and Dovlaka, and everything was arranged for him, ready and waiting for his return. But things did not work out as simply as you might think. For although the two Fiacres had shared the kingship for many years, resentment had been growing in the heart of Fiacre Dov. And he waited for his moment. For when Fiacre Finn had his guard down and only a small group of warriors to defend him, and on that day, Fiacre Dove took an army against him, laid siege to the house of Fiacre Finn, and killed his fellow king. Now the people of Ulster were so unsettled by this that they appealed to Mananon MacLear to bring Mangan back, the son of Fiacre Finn, but Mananon MacLear refused. And not only that, but he kept Mangan in Tir Changara for another ten years and did not let him back in Ireland till he was sixteen years old. Mangan's return was greeted with great celebration. People of Ulster were not comfortable with how Fiacre Dove had conducted himself. But Fiacre Dove offered Mangan terms that they would share the kingship just as he had done with Mongan's father, Fiacre Finn, and that Mongan would have Dovlaka, his daughter's hand in marriage, which had been arranged on the day they were born. Now, it might be that because he had never met his father, Fiacre Finn, Mongan had no particular attachment to the idea of avenging his death, or it might be because when he saw Dovlaka, he was so struck by her beauty that he lost his wits a little bit, as young men sometimes do. But whatever the reason, Mungan agreed to these terms, and Dovlaka came back to live in his house. But one day, when they were playing chess, a cleric turned up and told Mangan and Dovlaka that Fiacre Dov was very nearly alone. He had only a small bodyguard with him, and if Mangan wanted to get revenge for his father's killing, now would be the time. Mangan, of course, checked with Dovlaka if she thought that this was an alright thing for him to do, but Dovlaka was very mindful of honour and she simply nodded her head. And so Mangan went and took his revenge. 
and killed Fyrgradov, and became the sole king of Ulster. And that cleric, who had prompted him so, revealed himself to be Mananon MacLear. Having taken up the kingship of Ulster, all on his own, Mongan announced to the nobles of Ulster that he had a plan. He was going to go on a tour of Ireland. He was going to meet all the kings of all the provinces. And he was going to ask for boons from them. And when they gave him stuff, he was going to come back to Ulster and share it out among all the nobles. And they all agreed that this was a fantastic idea. And so Mongan set out on his tour of Ireland. And when he came to Leinster, he saw a most beautiful sight. A herd of 50 cattle, white with red ears. And when he looked at them, his heart was filled with love for these cattle. The king of Leinster, Bran saw the look on Mongan's face when he looked at these white cows with the red ears. And Brandov said to him, The way you look at those cows, I can see that you love them and that you want to take them back with you. Back home to Ulster, to where you're married, aren't you? To what was her name? Dovlaka, wasn't it? She's a very beautiful girl, your wife. But Mangan was distracted by the cows and said, yes, yes, I would love to take those cows back home with me. And Brandov said, well, I, I could give them to you. I mean, the only reason that I would give them to you would be in exchange for friendship without refusal. And if, if you'd be interested. And Mangan immediately agreed. He took the cattle back up to Ulster and he showed them off to Dovlaka who agreed that they were magnificent beasts. And then a little while later, the King of Leinster, Brandov, turned up for a visit. And he said, I'm here to claim my friendship without refusal from you, Mongan. And Mongan said, if there's anything in the whole of Ulster that's in my power to give you, you have only to ask. And he said, I want your wife, Dovlaka. Now Mangan was stunned. Never in his wildest dreams would he have thought that this would be what Brandov would ask him for. And he was ready there and then to go to war, but Dovlaka put her hand on his arm and said, honour is more lasting than life, but Leave this to me now for a second. And she walked over to Brandov and she took him aside and she said, Listen, I'm madly in love with you. I have been in love with you for years. This is fantastic. I cannot wait to be your wife. The only problem is... I am so incredibly in love with you that I'm afraid that you're going to get tired of me, that you're not going to love me back as much as I really, really love you. So I'm going to go with you only on one condition. And Brandov said, name it. And Dovlaka said, I need you to prove your love to me. I need you to wait a year until we are married. And until the end of that year, I need you to promise me you will not even touch me. You and I won't even be in the same house. And if you ever do come into the same house, you have to sit in a different seat to me all the way across the other side of the room. And if you do this, I will know that you love me as much as I love you. 
because you'll have to court me for an entire year. It makes sense. Don't think about it. And the King of Leinster, Brando, agreed to Dovlaka's condition. He brought her away to Leinster and he set her up in her own house. And he set her up in her own house with her own servants and her own companions. And one of her companions, one of the closest, was married to a man named Macandal, who was a servant to Mangan, for they'd been born on the same day. Now, as soon as Dovlaka left, Mangan was taken with a wasting sickness. He took to his bed. He could not move from it. But Macandal, Macandal had a different reaction to his wife leaving him and going to Leinster. Macandal started complaining and he went to Mongan and he said, you know, this friendship without refusal is all very well and good for you who made the bargain, but I didn't make any bargain with anybody in Leinster that my wife would leave me for a year or forever and I miss my wife. So, I need you to do something about it. I want to visit my wife. I want to see her. I want to sleep with her. I want to do it now. What are you going to do? Mongan, stirred by his friend's words, pulled himself together and said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to visit. But first, I need you to do something for me. I need you to bring me a big, wide basket with two sods of earth in it, one from Ireland and one from Scotland, because the druids of the King of Leinster are going to be making spells to look at me. So bring this to me. And as soon as the basket was brought to Mangan, Mangan put one foot on the sod from Scotland and one foot on the sod from Ireland, and he said, now, now if their druids put spells on me to find out what it is that I'm doing, they'll tell Brandov, Mangan has one foot in Scotland and one foot in Ireland. And he'll draw his own conclusions from that. But at any rate, he'll think my mind is far away from here. On their way to Leinster, Mangan and Macandor saw a priest of Kilcaman the famous Tibrida walking along with his cleric behind him and he reading out of a book of Psalms. Now, Macandoev had never seen anything like this in his entire life. So he kept nudging Mangan and going, what's he saying? What's your man saying? What's he after saying? And Mangan said he's reading from a book What's the other fella saying? All he's doing is saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. Why is he saying that? And Mangan said, It's a book of Psalms, which is... But Mangan said, Look, you've given me an idea. And he created a river flowing through the plain just ahead of the priest and the cleric with a little bridge going over it. Now, Tibberda stopped dead when he got to the bridge and looked up from his book and said, how is there a river here? And I never noticed it before. My father was born in these lands. My grandfather was born in these lands. I never heard of any river here before now. But sure, look, at least there's a bridge. And he carried on over the bridge, reading from his book and his cleric followed behind him. And when they were halfway across, the bridge collapsed under them. And Mangan said to Macandoev, should I let them drown? And Macandoev said, yeah, why not? But Mangan said, no, no, that seems a bit extreme. They didn't do anything to me. And so he had the river wash the two of them up a mile further down. But he also had the waters he'd created carry away the Book of Psalms from Tiburth and into his hand. And then he struck himself and Macandoev with a hazel wand and put the appearance of the priest and the cleric on them both. And then on they went, with Mangan walking ahead, reading from the Book of Psalms, 
and Mac and Dive walking behind, dutifully saying Amen, 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 whenever he thought of it. And in this manner, they came to the house where Devlaka was staying, and they let themselves in. Now, their disguises fooled the guards, but Devlaka and her attendant, they knew their husbands straight away, and they lost no time taking them out of the sight of everybody else. We're confessing. They're hearing our confession, Devlaka said to everyone who was attending her, and sent them out so that she and her husband could have a bit of privacy. There was an old hag who listened at the door, though, and she thought this was a ferocious scandal, the two women carrying on so with holy men. But Dovlaka put a word in Mongin's ear, and he killed the hag before she could tell anyone what was going on. So they had a very pleasant visit, the four of them together, until there was a noise at the gates. And when Mongan looked out the window, who did he see but Tibritha the priest, who had arrived with three times nine men? And Mongan called out, Oh, that's Mongan, the king of Ulster. He's put my appearance on himself to try and sneak in and see his wife. What a rat. And so the king of Leinster's men gave chase. They chased off the real Tibritha and slaughtered the men he'd brought with him. Realising then that they were pushing their luck, Mongen and Mackendorf went back home to Ulster, and Mongen immediately fell back into his wasting sickness. And there he spent a quarter of the year, unable to move or think or do anything but sigh for the loss of the Vlaka. Eventually, Mackendorf's complaining got to him again, and he sent Mackendorf down to Leinster to carry a message, knowing, or claiming, that he himself would not be able to go. Dovlaka was concerned about her husband. When Mackendorf told her the kind of shape he was in, she said, Look, the King of Leinster is going to be away for a little while. He's making a tour of the countryside, so tell Mongan to come down quick. I know how to motivate him. We'll shake him out of this weak manner that he's behaving in. So Mackendorf brought Mongan down to Leinster to meet Dovlaka, and she challenged her husband to a game of fidget. And as they were playing, she opened the top of her dress and let her two white breasts fall out. And Mongan sat there and looked at them for a while. And gradually, in his heart, there kindled some passion, some motivation to get his wife back. But then the King of Leinster arrived at the gates. Mongan and Mackendorf had to make their escape, and the King of Leinster asked Dovlaka, was Mongan here? And Dovlaka said, yes, he was. He has a greater claim on me than you do, because we're not married. And we won't be, because you still haven't proven your love to me to my satisfaction, because it's not the end of the year yet. Now Brandov was frustrated, but there was little he could do, and so he asked her, will you tell me when you long for Mongan? Because that way I'll know when he's not here. And Dovlaka promised that she would. Back in Ulster, the year was coming to a close. The year that Dovlaka, with her wits, had bought from Brandov, and Mongan lay in his wasting sickness. And this time, none of the barbs of Mackendorf could rouse him, nor could the memory of the breasts of Dovlaka. And finally, the people of Ulster came to him. And they offered to go to war on his behalf, to bring back his queen and to restore their king, who was not doing a good job of being a king because he was lying in bed, sighing at having lost his wife. And this roused Mongan. And he said, no, I lost her by my foolishness. And no woman's son of Ulster should pay for my foolishness with his life. 
I must win her back. I must win her back with craftiness as I lost her with foolishness and I must drag no one else into this. And with that he leapt out of bed and he made for Leinster. Just in time to make it to the wedding of Dovlaka and Brando. On his way to the wedding, Mongan made a visit to the Hag of the Hills. And he asked her if she'd like to accompany him to a very fine wedding that was happening in Leinster. Now the Hag of the Hills was famously hideous. Teeth crooked and mossy as tumbled old gravestones. Hair as coarse as straw. Skin all pockmarked and covered in sores and scabs. Limbs twisted. And she said she'd love to go to a wedding. Twas years since she had danced at a wedding. And Mangan said, you know, I really like your clothing of animal skins and bits of moss. But would you mind if I changed your appearance a little for the gathering we'll be going to? And she said not at all, she'd be delighted. And so Mangan took out his hazel rod and he struck the Hag of the Hills with it. And he gave her the appearance of a beautiful young woman. And he put a love spell into her cheeks. And he put his arm through her arm. And he brought the Hag of the Hills to the wedding of Brando and Dovlaka. Now Brando at his wedding was full of excitement. He had waited a full year. Having waited so long to be with Dovlaka, who he had wanted from afar for years, and to know that he had so thoroughly gotten one over on the King of Ulster, was enough to delight the heart of anyone. And then into the feast walked none other than his rival Mangan, and on his arm was a woman even more beautiful than the beautiful Dovlaka. And jealousy stirred in the heart of Brando. Now Mangan called out a cheerful greeting and said they were friends he hoped, for their friendship without refusal had been honoured on both sides, and he was there today to congratulate Brando and Dovlaka on finally getting to be together. Brando said, yeah, but okay, that's fine, but that, that girl that you're with is lovely. And Mangan said, oh, yes, she is, and we're very, very happy together. And it's thanks to you and our friendship without refusal that she and I met. Brandov said, well, we still have a friendship without refusal, don't we? Mangan said, yes, of course. Brandov said, well, in that case, I want her. I don't want Dovlaka anymore. I want her. And Dovlaka said, hold on now, because... If you give me up, you'll be breaking my condition. And whatever bargain you have with my husband, you also made a deal with me. And that was to be true to me, to prove your love to me throughout this year. But Brandov had no eyes or ears for Dovlaka at all. He only looked at the transformed hag. And Mangan, with a great show of reluctance, gave her up to the King of Leinster. 
took Dovlaka into his arms and gave her three kisses just to seal the deal and then a few more besides. But the King of Leinster had eyes only for this beautiful woman who was giggling and flirting and tossing her hair. Mangan and Dovlaka made their way back to Ulster, full of relief. Macandau was delighted to see his wife returned to him, and the people of Ulster rejoiced that their king would finally be back to his old self. Brandov and the Hag of the Hills had a wild night altogether. They danced at the wedding feast. They went to bed together. They fell asleep in one another's arms. And in the morning, Brandov was awakened by a strange smell, as if of untanned hides and unwashed skin. And he looked down at the woman who was nestled in his arms. And he recognised her. And when she opened her eyes, smiling up at him with her mossy, crooked teeth, he said to her, Are you, by chance, the hag of the hills? I am, said she. And Brandov, the king of Leinster, said to her, I wish I didn't see you. There you go. A beautiful story. Part one and part two of King Mangan. Hope you enjoyed that. And thanks to Surika Hegarty, my sister, for writing and coming up with that telling of it. There are more uh, details of where she got the sources in the show notes below. This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan. The music was by the very same man, Oshin Ryan, with a little help from Rue O'Shea. Thank you to all of those who have always, as ever, helped us and, you know, continue to help us grow in with Candlelit Tales. There are too many to count, but we wouldn't be here without your continued support that we receive through Patreon and through the likes and shares that we, we get as well. If so, if you would like to support us, you can share it with your friends. Give a like or a follow on our YouTube page where we have more content being released. Hashtag Candlelittle Tales is also a thing as well because we have Candlelittle Tales for Kids, a series that was produced during lockdown and still trying to tell stories specifically for kids. So go on to YouTube and check it out. You can also support us directly by going to Patreon and anything you have would be, you know, greatly appreciated it would help us out immensely patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales we'd love to get uh, comments or remarks from people so you can email us your questions or suggestions uh, to info at candlelittales.ie you can also message us directly on facebook or instagram if you'd like to find out more about us you can go to the website candlelittales.ie and if you'd like to book a live show can't believe there's live shows again you can get on to us on bookings at candlelittales.ie hopefully the live shows will be commencing soon and we can't get back can't wait to get back at it but that's all from us for now we'll be continuing our little series of king stories next week and as always if you want to tune into the post show discussion the very next episode that is I will be going live on YouTube at 7 p.m. Irish time on Sunday evening. We'll be talking about this story and what's going to happen next with the King Cycles. So tune in there or listen in afterwards on the very next episode. That's all from us for now. Thank you. Oki Mugmidan was the King of Ireland, an unsettled Ireland at this time. Feuds, wars, invasions were the trials of any good king, but Oki Magmedan weathered them better than most, in that he wasn't killed and managed to keep some semblance.